so my title this morning for the sermon is The Sower Sows, Part Two. And those of you who listen closely over the last uh, few, which is, of course, all of you, uh, the last uh, few months will recognize that as the closing tagline to a sermon that uh, Pastor Chris uh, preached about two and a half months ago in late May, um, where he, he's teaching through the Sermon on the Mount and read the parable that we read this morning, the parable of the sower, one of the most uh, well-known parables uh, of all of those that Jesus told. And he closed his sermon with, and it was up on you know his screen and um, and he repeated it a number of times, the sower sows, the sower sows, and he expanded a bit, um, but, but left us with that line. Actually, that was the introduction. And the sower sows part one will be about the practical side of sowing. And the sower sows part two is uh, the theological foundation for sowing. And as I thought about this sermon, um, logically you would start with number one, but every time I thought it through, um, um, this, is, this is what I kept coming back to. So today you get part two. I really look forward to preaching part one at some point, uh, presumably um, when the Lord says it's the right time. So go back to the parable. And you, you know I ask questions, and, and, and I would like you to answer, and uh, at least Fletcher's here this morning. He's used to that model, um, but, but please speak up. So in the parable, who is the sower? Jesus says, a sower went out to sow and sowed seed into different soil and got different results. Who is the sower in that parable? Louder? The farmer, and who is the farmer? Who is Jesus referring to? Well, you've jumped ahead for me. So, absolutely. I think at the service, Jesus is the sower, right? And he sows the seed, right? And what is the seed? The word of God. It's the gospel message. And what is the gospel message? God loves us. It's a message of salvation. And for me, it was a bit of an aha moment in the fall Bible study, those of us who, who attended that. Um, you know, I was always taught the gospel message is a message of salvation, and certainly it is, but it's much bigger than that. It's the, it's the message of the kingdom of God, right? And so that's the word uh, that the sower sows. And um, what's the soil? That's our hearts, absolutely, right? And um, the parable goes on to describe different types of soils and different results as seed is planted uh, in those soils. Now, when we sow, when we plant a garden, how do we plant seed? Describe, I mean, several of you have gardens, right? And of course, we know it's rocky soil up here, but um, how do you plant a seed? Just, just describe it to me. Richard, you just, you broadcast it. Is that how most of you plant your gardens? Okay, Becky, how do you plant? All right, so, so you poke a hole in the ground and you put some seed in that and some types of seed, we actually build a little mound and put several seeds in there. Okay, all right, my child grow, all right. And then, you know, some of them, some uh, of those serious gardeners, they even put down the black plastic, right? And there's just a hole for the seedling to pop up through, right? All right, and, you know, seed is, no longer terribly expensive, but uh, it's not necessarily cheap depending. So, so we're careful about where we plant and we certainly wouldn't plant where it's obvious seed isn't gonna grow. That's a waste, right? Um, 
And I have to think seed back then was a lot more valuable, a lot more expensive. Uh, you couldn't look up in the burpee catalog and, and order what you wanted for the season. But how does the sower sow in the parable? Richard? How does the sower sow in the parable? Absolutely broadcasting, throwing it everywhere, throwing it on the, the path, the hardened path, throwing it on uh, soil with rocks all over the place, sowing it on fertile soil, so, sowing it on thorns. Thorns, did you wonder why this farmer has thorns in his field? Why didn't he get rid of the thorns? And the answer to that question is, this is before electric fences and barbed wire, right? So thorns were actually planted a hedge around the perimeter to keep critters out. And if you want to cross-check me, I don't think critters is in the, the, the uh, King James Version. But um, so, so what's the message of this farmer who's planting indiscriminately, just tossing seed everywhere. Doesn't matter where it falls. Why that contrast to the way we plant seed? And probably any intelligent farmer in that time planted seed. And the answer to that question is, God is telling us, my storehouse, where this seed comes from, that's infinite. Don't worry about they're not being enough. If you need more, I will give you more. One, two, don't worry about where you plant because you can't tell the hearts of men. You can't read the hearts of men, all right? You won't know whether that's good soil or not, so just plant. The Holy Spirit will do the work of killing the soil so that it's good soil and receptive. So don't worry about it. Just plant everywhere. So indiscriminately. Um, so what does sowing look like? How do you do the act of sowing? And as I told you, that's, that's so, the sower sows part two, but I'll give you two examples that came up in our congregation within the past couple of weeks. One was uh, we had a band concert on the common, right? And lots of people from Aetna and even beyond came. And before the concert started, Pastor Chris got up and welcomed everybody to the band concert. And then he said, that building behind me across the parking lot, guys, that's a church. And we meet there every Sunday and we'd love for you to come and join us. Now he knew he was talking to mixed soil. He knew that not everybody was gonna jump up and say, oh, let's go right now and go to church. But he was sowing seed indiscriminately. You're invited. We want you to know. We would love to have you come join us. Another example. Uh, last Sunday, Becky Lewis stood up and introduced two through hikers from the AT. Come to find out, she regularly picks up hikers wherever she sees them and invites them to church. She'll pick them up to take them into town or wherever they're going, not on the trail because they don't allow that, but but um, into town and take them back where she picked them up and they continue their hike. And she always invites them to church. She's sowing. It's up to the Holy Spirit whether or not it takes root. But last week, two people joined us for church and they were delighted that they were able to come to church in the middle of their hike uh, uh, of the AT. We'll talk more about that uh, downstream. Now, Once we plant the seed, what else do we do to the seed in the garden, particularly when it doesn't rain? We water it. What else do we do to tend the garden? We weed it. We pull out the weeds. We cultivate it. We might even add a little fertilizer, right? We tend the garden. Uh, we help it grow. Now, here's the toughest question I'm going to ask. In scripture, what is the word for tending the garden? This is tough. Extra points if you get it. All right, I'll give you a hint. Jesus was teaching this parable to his disciples. And tending the garden is discipleship. 
All right. That's the word for tending the garden. And Jesus was modeling discipleship throughout his ministry. He modeled it for his disciples and he models it for us. It's taking the word of God and applying it to your life and saying, what difference does this make? How do I live? Having seen what's reflected here in scripture, what difference does that make for me each day as I live my life? Cultivating the plants that are growing in the garden is discipleship. And I believe for those of you who've been attending Bible study um, uh, were in the spring and the early summer, that's exactly what Pastor Chris was modeling there. How do we take the sermon? How do we take the scripture that we looked at last Sunday and think about what does that mean for me? What does that mean for my life? Now, Jesus is discipling the disciples. That's where we get their name uh, as a group. Do we disciple? Right? Jesus was sowing, and it's clear he wants us to sow. Jesus was discipling. Do we disciple? Do we tend the garden? What do you think? Yes. I think absolutely. In fact, Jesus' final command as he left this earth was, you know, go ye into all the world and make disciples of all men. That's what he was saying, I'm commissioning you to do. Certainly in our families, we, we tend the garden with our children, right? And we wouldn't think of not watering and fertilizing and cultivating that garden. And I think the same is true of the church. We are given a responsibility to make sure that the seedlings in our church flourish. And we're at all sorts of different places on our walk uh, of faith. And so we have all sorts of different responsibilities to do that. <clears throat> in the passage that Skip uh, read, it goes on in Corinthians, it goes on to use another metaphor um, of Jesus as the master builder. And um, we are living stones being jointly fit together. And before you put a stone into the building, any of the masons there, what do you do with a stone when you pick it up and you look at where it's going to go? What's the first thing you have to do? You have to dress the stone. What does it mean to dress a stone? Say again. You have to make it the right size, the right, right shape, uh, and, and actually the right finish to go into the wall or the foundation or whatever you're building. Right? That, that's another metaphor for discipleship uh, that, that we're supposed to be doing. And I strongly suspect that Pastor Chris at some point is going to say, now, I can't disciple everybody in this congregation, particularly as the pews get a little more full. It's your responsibility, you members of the church, to help me with that job of discipling the congregation. And again, we all have different roles in that. All right. Some of us are encouragers. Some of us are teachers. Some of us are all sorts of different gifts. And so we find our role in that. But it is all of our responsibility to help tend that garden to uh, disciple, uh, help the, the plants in this garden grow. Now, to continue the metaphor more completely, occasionally a shrub or a tree will get top heavy in one direction or another, or there will even be dead branches. And so what do we do uh, in our gardens when that happens? We prune them, right? And the scriptures say, um, let me get the, the uh, citation right. John 15, one through four, my father is the master gardener, Jesus says. No fruit um, goes without, um, you know, being pruned. If uh, a limb is dead, it will be cut off. And if a limb is bearing fruit, it will be pruned so it can bear more fruit. All right. So clearly God prunes in this garden. Question, do we prune? We've been assigned the task of sowing. We've been assigned the task of tending the garden. 
do we prove? What do you think? I see some no's. Well, we certainly prune in our families, right? As we raise our children. Now, I will say to you, my father pruned very differently than my mother pruned. Uh, I preferred my mother doing the pruning. But um, I think the answer to the question is, Yes, we are called to prune, but very, very carefully, because we can, we can do serious damage by pruning in, in property. So only if it's clear the Holy Spirit is saying, this is something I want you to do. And you might even check it with somebody else you trust. Um, but I do think at times we are called to share in that work as well, but very, very cautiously, if at all. All right, now the good part, we uh, sowed, the seed uh, 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 sprouted, uh, now it's flourishing, and now there's fruit. So what's the last act in the garden? The harvest, all right? And uh, scriptures go on uh, with this metaphor as well. And um, Matthew 9.30 uh, talks about the Lord of the harvest. So the question is, uh, clearly, God is Lord of the harvest. So God harvests. Do we harvest? It is clear God harvests. Uh, scriptures tell us over and over again. Do we get to harvest? All right, general sense of yes, we do get to harvest. In fact, Continuing with that scripture, um, it says, Jesus says, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out the laborer. That's us. And John 4, 35 says, lift up your eyes to the fields, for they are right unto harvest. And go into the fields and harvest. Now, I think this gets a little tricky. As I read through this back and forth and thinking about it, I think God's harvest is that final harvest where we're gathered into the storehouse. Um, and that one, that, that's, God will do that harvesting. But in that scripture, the fields are white unto harvest. I think is what he's saying, go sow. What he's saying, I think is, the Holy Spirit has tilled the soil. The soil is fertile. But unless somebody sows, there will never be any harvest. And so the fields are white into harvest. You're saying Jesus is, is expressing a sense of urgency. People are dying. And once that happens, there isn't a second chance. So get out there and sow so we can harvest. And the scriptures play on this uh, in several uh, places. Um, Both he who reaps and he who sows may rejoice. The one who sows and the one who reaps are not always the same, all right? He says, um, I'm going to find that passage. Well, he says, um, you sow that someone else will reap and someone else sows that you may reap. And so he goes back and forth. And so we get to do all those things. Now, there's one thing that we do not get to do, and Skip read this. Back in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 15, did you catch its verse? I think it's verse three. Did you catch, Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, and what's the third? Anybody kick that, pick that up? and the Lord caused the growth. That one we don't do. In fact, the scriptures play with us and say, you can't do it, you silly. He said, not a one of you can add an inch to the length of your hair. I do that. Goes on to say, now this is before Revlon and Cler Clairol. It says, not one of you can turn your you know, hair to black or white. It is what, I, so, so I guess we, the new translation, your natural hair color from black to white. Try to throw in a little humor. 
Um, God gives the growth. Now, I think this is a terrifically freeing concept. All right. I think we often don't sow because we think it'll be wasted. It won't grow. The soil's not ready. We're worried about the results. I'm not sure that seed will grow here. And Jesus is saying, don't worry. I give the growth. Just so, Jesus said. It's not your concern whether it grows. It's your assignment to sow. In our economy, mine particularly, um, for those who don't know me, I'm a finance guy. For me, everything is return on investment. Why would I sow where it's not going to grow? All right, we, we keep score, we measure. That's the way we're wired. And Jesus said, forget that, just sow. Sow wherever you go, sow uh, all the time, sow indiscriminately, I will take care of the growth. And I'll even make God speaking, Jesus speaking, I will make sure there's somebody to water it and cultivate it and harvest it. But your job is to sow. And I think that's a really freeing concept. We don't have to worry about whether it's going to grow. That's on the Holy Spirit. You see what I'm saying? Just so, wherever you go, is the message here. And that's why I love the tagline. Chris kept flashing this up, and he kept interrupting himself, saying, the sower sows. No need to judge the soil. You can't anyhow. Only God uh, can read the hearts of men. Just so, so liberally, so indiscriminately, so wherever you go. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful that you sowed seeds in our hearts and that it took root. And you've given us a congregation where we can grow and walk the Christian life together with others who uh, will help us. And we ask you to, to move in our hearts if we're to help someone else. And most of our Father this week, we ask that you prompt us to sow wherever we are, whoever we run into, whatever we're doing, show us here's an opportunity to sow. And then I pray that we will act on that. Amen.